for you. But without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our Bluegrass, our Blue Crab team, who are here today to give you a little bit of overview about their work. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Hello, everyone. Would you like to introduce yourselves real quick before we get started? Yeah. Sure. So my name is Katherine Becker and I've been on this Blue Crab project for just under two years in Jacksonville here with Sam. Yeah, and then I started, it'll be about three and a half years ago on this project here in Jacksonville. Well, thank you both for joining us. If you want to start your presentation. Yeah, All right. I think you can see this. Alright, so this is where we are located. Um, we are in the very northern part of Florida near the Georgia line. Um, you can see the little dot there and then a little uh, more specifically you can see us with the big star uh, Jacksonville right there on the east coast of um, Florida. We study in the St. Johns River, which is the longest north flowing river in Florida. It is 310 miles long. This river has both freshwater and saltwater areas, and it includes habitats such as salt marshes, oyster reefs, and submerged seagrass beds, which are all perfect areas and habitats for blue crabs. So here's our blue crab. Uh, this is a male and they are defined by their exoskeleton and that's what we would call, most people would call its shell, its outer shell um, that defines, defines it as a crab. And then this is the carapace, the top shell uh, with the pointy spines. And then the alpha crustacyanin is actually the protein that makes the blue crab blue. It gives it that color and you can also find that in lobsters even though lobsters aren't predominantly blue. And then it's uh, known as a decapod. So deca meeting 10 it has 10 legs. And there uh, one through three are the legs that help it uh, move. And then the swimmerettes that those control how the crab swims in the water and then of course the two claws that they use to defend themselves and eat. Some fun facts about the blue crab. The scientific name is Kalanectes sapidus which translates to beautiful savory swimmer because they're such pretty swimmers. They breathe underwater with their gills and they can actually survive out of water as long as their gills are wet. They generally live one to three years. However, some studies have shown them to live up to five and eight years. And this blue crab fishery is the top five most valuable fisheries in Florida. So here's a video of a female blue crab and we'll talk more of what makes her a female uh, later, but she's just kind of hanging out on the shoreline. You can see her walking with those three legs too, and then her back swimmer is kind of guiding her along in the water. On the left here, you can see what a male crab looks like, versus on the right, you can see what female crabs look like, and you can see based on their abdomen, if it's a male or a female. And like even though all the ones on the right look different, the top one on the right is just a female that has eggs. The middle one is a mature female and the bottom one is an immature female. So here's an example of how the females progress with eggs. Uh, throughout their stages with the bright orange being the first stage and then it progresses to what we call a rusty color and then to a brown at the bottom right where she's about to shed her eggs. 
uh, the females release them in salty water and that ate what's called an apron that holds all the eggs together. Um, they produce about 47,000 to as many as 5.4 million eggs at one time. And they may release their eggs at two to different times or intervals. And after releasing them, the eggs will hatch in about nine to 14 days. For us, we do something called the fisheries independent monitoring, meaning that we collect the crabs ourselves. And some objectives that we have for this study is to determine like how many males or females we have in the river, as well as the size of the crab. And then we also use that data to calculate something called the catch per unit effort or the CPUE that we'll explain in a minute. So here is our research setup. Uh, that's our truck and the boat we take out every day to go collect the traps. Uh, we named our boat Flaticus, something fun. And then to the right is a picture of the, the habitat that we do research in that we find our blue crabs in. That is a saltwater marsh that borders um, the ocean in Jacksonville. This is an example then of how we grab the crabs. So we pull up the pot. Whoever is pulling the pot then counts how many crabs are in the pot. We then dump that pot of crabs into a bin so that we can collect more measurements on them later. You'll also see her shaking out anything else in the pot. In this case, a nice little clump of algae. And then we get rid of the old bait. Put in some new bait. Use two pieces of mackerel. You close the pot back up so that no crabs escape from the top. So our buoy and line back over into the water. And then when we're in position, we toss that pot back over. So here are some of the measurements we take on every one of those crabs that we dumped into the bin. We take uh, these measurements, carapace height in the green on the left, carapace length, so you can see it in the red there, and then carapace width, it's a little hard to tell, but body width is actually from the spine to the spine, the blue line, and then the carapace width is a little bit smaller, the yellow measurement without the spines. Some other things that can actually grow on the crabs include bacteria, which you'll see on the far left, algae, which are on the middle, and barnacles on the right. And these are just things that can naturally grow on the crab. It doesn't really too much affect the crab unless they get too much bacteria. So this is how one of the things we talked about earlier, calculating catch per unit effort. And we have what's called um, a line that's composed of anywhere from five to nine pots. And then we calculate how many um, crabs are in the catch per unit effort. So we divide the number of crabs per line by the number of pots, and then we get the CPUE. So an example of this is if we have 50 crabs and five pots, what is the CPUE? So we'll take 50 and divide it by 5 and we'll get a CPUE of 10. So this is our CPUE over the course of the year. Um, we've only been doing this, we're in our second year, so we haven't quite established uh, a really large trend over a number of years, but you can see it peaks in August, September, and October, and then it goes down considerably in the springtime. We can also use that catch per unit effort to look at differences based on 
where we're at in the river. So if you look at the graph on the x-axis, you'll see JR, JG, and JV, which represent our three different sites. And each site has three to four lines in there. The JR is the most farthest south site, and that is the freshest water that we have. And it is predominantly mostly male crabs, as you can see from the graph, versus JV, which is our area that's closest to the ocean and gets that tidal influx of salt water, has more females. So right now we're going to do um, some, show you some crabs, uh, the difference between males and females. And uh, just to explain, these crabs are put on ice so they don't uh, they don't pinch us, but normally if you see a blue crab, you don't really want to pick them up like I'm picking them up because they will pinch you. First, we have a male crab. So again, you can, <coughs> you can tell by the abdomen that it is a male crab. You'll see the two claws again, the four other legs, these three are the walking legs, and that last one is the pretty swimmerette. Next, we have an immature female. As you can tell on this one, she is a lot smaller than that male, and you notice that triangle on the abdomen that indicates that it is a immature female. So she's nice and she's considerably smaller than the male, but she'll get big enough to this larger female we have with eggs. You can see the eggs under her apron here. So this is the apron that distinguishes it from a male. And it's you can see that it's holding in all these eggs until they're ready to be deposited. And then do the trap. We yeah. also have a what we call a trap or a pot that we collect the crabs in just to demonstrate how big it is. <laughs> and you can see the line that helps us catch to retrieve the pot. It's got a buoy with our label of FWC on it, so we know who it belongs to. And then you can see the openings here where the crabs go in. And they'll go in sideways, because remember the crabs move side to side instead of front to back. We also then have the bait well, and that is where we put our bait in to attract the crabs. <laughs> And with that, do we have any questions? We definitely have some questions. Let me ask our helper to share her screen. Um, and I have, yeah, we have quite a few that came in. So, I mean, I expected it. So we'll just wait for our screen. And, well, all right, here it comes. Oh. Here it comes, okay. All right. Um, <laughs> So questions, uh, how deep can blue crabs live? I'm thinking that means like when you, like how, how deep of water, are they out in the deep ocean? Are they closer inland? They're generally on the coastal shore, but also after um, three miles offshore, it's not that you won't get blue crabs, but um, for commercial fishery, fishermen, it has to be within three miles from shore. Okay, so, and I think you, you've touched on this briefly, but so can they live in both freshwater and saltwater? Yes, they mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. And they can actually go from the salt to the fresh and from the fresh to the salt. Okay, so what eats a blue crab? What are their predators? Yeah, lots of game fish. Yeah. Um, game fish. Like red, this red drum is a very common game fish down here in Jacksonville and they love to eat them. Um, 
So another question, do they swim or do they just crawl? Uh, they'll do both. They'll use those swimmerettes to uh, swim if they're not at the bottom of the sediment like you saw in the video mm -hmm. where they were th that video. It was doing more of a crawl. It was using those inner three legs to just move along the surface of the sand almost like a spider. And then when they want to really move, they'll they'll get suspended in the water column and use their swimmerettes. All right. Uh, they want to know if you have ever seen a blue crab shed its eggs. Oh. We've seen them depositing um, where it's a bright orange basically on their abdomen, but it's not firm enough to really be the full egg case yet. Um, but we, at least I have not witnessed them actually releasing yeah. the eggs. In, in the St. Yeah. John's River here in Jacksonville, the clarity of the water is very degraded. So you, it's very turbid, lots of mud in the um, water column. So it's very hard to see anything in the water unless it's very close to shoreline like that, that video. So I haven't seen them depositing eggs, but I think that'd be really neat to see that. I think so too. What about what does a blue crab eat? They're the non picky eaters yeah. Of, yeah. Of, of the river here. They'll eat everything from mollusks. So you heard about oysters earlier. Um, they'll eat other crabs and they'll eat other fish. They'll also eat some algae too based on where they're at. So they're the non picky ones. Non picky eaters. Yeah. All right, we have a question from the Alva Middle School who wanted to know what is the biggest crab you've ever documented? Oh, 220. Yeah, with 220. Uh, I would say, I think if, if you were to do from spine to spine, what we call that big measurement can demonstrate. So this measurement from here to here, I think was about nine inches. And just for reference, this crab here is about five and a half inches. So nine inches is really big, but that, wow. that's not entirely common to get that. You get that size more often around six inches. All right. A couple of folks want to know if putting the crab on ice will harm the eggs. No, um, I actually did a study before we started this study looking at escapement of crabs. So we put crabs in a pot off the dock here, and some of those were females that had eggs. And we put them on ice when we work them up just to make sure that we don't get pinched with the almost 200 crabs that will work up in a day. So, but we put them in that pot and they were doing fine the rest of the week before we released them from that pot. So they still do really well after the ice. Yeah, they were put on ice about 10 minutes before our presentation. So it's not like it's hours on end yeah. and they'll get put in the water. Our facility right now, we're located right on the water here. They'll get put back in the river. All right, so uh, while we're on the egg topic, do all blue e crab eggs hatch? No, um, they have they produce so many eggs because there's a high chance that not all of those eggs will actually be able to hatch and grow into eventually a blue crab. So there's a high mortality rate, so a lot of them die off. So to fix that, they then produce a lot of eggs. All right. Somebody wants to know how often do you catch a crab in pre-molt phase? Hmm. Pre-molt phase? Quite a bit. <laughs> um, we actually have three different pre-molt phases that we look at. Um, going from, if you're familiar with it, a white line, a pink line, or a red line. A red line crab is right about to molt. Um, I'd say maybe a quarter percent. Yeah, about 20 percent yeah. of them. And that's also one of the things that we collect data on is to follow the trends during the time of year when they are when they're molting and when they're about to molt or um, so we're collecting data on that as well. 
we also get crabs that will molt in our pot too. Mm -hmm. So we will collect data on both the molted shell and then the soft crab itself to see how fast they grow after molting too. All right, can you have a blue crab as a pet? <laughs> you can, it's just, I knew someone that had one and it's a lot of upkeep. Yeah. <laughs> In order to get yeah. them to survive through their molting phases, um, you gotta have pretty much the exact right salinity conditions, you know, salt of the water, um, temperature. I don't know if that matters on state, uh, different state wildlife agencies um, might dictate different rules too, but I don't know. Being that you can rec re recreationally fish, <laughs> um, for yeah, yeah. fish for them, I'm sure if you caught one and wanted to try to keep, keep one it. as a pet, <laughs> good luck. <Sorry. laughs> yeah. We'll just do a couple more. So um, and we know they're found in Florida. Are they found outside of Florida? Yes. They're all the way up the East Coast and all the way around in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. So they also go all the way down to South America. So mm -hmm. they're pretty widespread. All right. Let's see. Can you can you eat blue crab eggs? Oh, that's that and that's illegal to harvest the females with the eggs. Um, I think in the 70s, at least in Florida, fishermen used to harvest them before laws were enacted, but that is now illegal. All right. And then finally, have you guys ever been pinched while working? <laughs> Definitely. It's a, it's, a, it's a rite of passage for the job to get pinched. Yeah, my worst so. pinch was definitely my first day. Yeah, I think oh, my yeah. first day also. Oh, <laughs> well, I think we're gonna um, we're gonna stop the questions here in the interest of time. But I wanted to thank you both so much for joining us today. This is a really popular topic all around yeah. Florida, I'm sure throughout the United States, and we appreciate your time. Bye bye now. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.